Welcome. We have Jamie, Dan, Edward, Goran, Jan, Mohammed, and myself, Michael. And we have a few topics to discuss, one of which is unprivileged jail execution. And Jan sounds like he has some reports from both a recent event and design issues. Uh, Jamie, have you put some thought into unprivileged jail execution? I know there was some discussion on a recent call. Uh, no, I'm afraid I haven't really done anything since last meeting on it. Understood. Edward. It's, it looks uh, like it's tax ahead. season, so uh, <laughs> things you too, huh? move quickly that aren't taxes right now. <laughs> Understood. Uh, Edward, you were part of an email discussion, and I think this is your first call. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, hello, I'm Edward Tomas Napirawa, uh, and I work at the University of Cambridge. In the past, I've worked for FreeBSD Foundation and Google Systems, among other things. And uh, and for the, for the in the context of this discussion, this is um, so my relationship with this is kind of twofold. One thing is uh months ago or a year ago, I've added the no new privs flag, which essentially neuters the few IDs. Um, and then I use that to implement unprivileged truth. And my assumption is it should be possible to use the same way to implement unprivileged um, JS, at least regarding the, the path name resolution and file system stuff. I don't know how unprivileged JS would look like from administrative administrative stuff because uh, different one difference between JS and truth is that uh, yes, it's correct. No new proofs. Um, so I believe that unprivileged truths are implemented right now are safe thing to do and to use, uh, but. Truths are invisible when you are outside. You don't have, for example, a command to list truths. Js are different, and I don't really know Js all that much. From my perspective, the main thing. So, when working on improved truths, I've actually asked Paul Hennicamp about his opinion about this, and from what I remember, he was actually encouraging me to to proceed with the JS, like do the same for JS. Uh, so from what I understand, this means that he doesn't really see any fundamental security issues with that either. Um, oh, and the other, the, the second aspect, uh, how I related to all this, um, there is this uh, effort to provide a sandboxing mechanism on top of Capsicum. And this appears completely unrelated, but the end effect, end result might be somewhat similar in purpose uh, to unprivileged jails. And also there's also one guy that I still need to respond uh, to his email, uh, who is, um, Essentially, he asked me about my thoughts on implementing compatibility with Linux C groups based on what we have uh, in FreeBSD. Um, essentially, the situation here there is that we could implement, I think we could implement C groups on top of unprivileged jails. Uh, he is leaning towards implementing them on top of logging classes, which I don't quite agree, but it's a terrible idea. But I also can see pros and cons. So, yeah. And that's login classes? Uh, yeah. Do, do you remember the thing in ETC master password? There's the field for a login class. Ah, yes. And at some point of, uh, at some point, those became not purely user space, but also, also visible to the kernel. So you can do psaux-o uh, login class, and it will show you login classes uh, each process belongs to. Um, but yeah, not very related, this one, to, to JS. 
but related to containment and virtualization, so it's totally fair game. Uh, probably. I mean, in the retrospect, I'm not sure removing them to kernel was a good idea, uh, but yeah. Let's focus on JS. I prefer JS. Sure. But the locking classes are, we have to be in the kernel because we're a way to track processes for enforcement of re restrictions by the kernel. So they, have to be a, so they have to be at least represented as something the kernel tracks and inherits and protects the integrity of. So, because you can't have any process just uh, writing to some magic memory address to change its logging class. So it has to be tracked in the kernel. I mean, the semantics attached to them, maybe they should be delegated back to user space so that you need a, a mechanism to decouple policy from implementation, but it gets sure. complex quickly. Yeah, so historically they were purely user space. Logging classes was something between, uh, I think login as in has been login. Uh, so it would just load the class from uh, something etc, then figure out what, for example, resource limits to apply, apply those limits, and that was it. Until I added logging classes to the kernel for, I think, RCTL. Uh, so the thing with the logging classes, from my perspective, like right now, they are, they do work, but they have two problems. First, they are not hierarchical. And second, they are kind of redundant compared to jails. You said they're um, theoretical. What? Or what was the first part? Uh, they are redundant compared to JS. Okay, like and we the can first part. Try, yeah. They are not hierarchical. You cannot have a logging class within other logging class. Like you can have jail within jail within okay. jail. Oh, logging I guess, class are flat. They only have a string name, and that's it. Um, and so there's no inheritance. And so, for example. Uh, all kinds of problems, really. Well, uh, logging classes aren't redundant until we have the often discussed and always projected uh, non-secure jail, which is only used as a parent for tracking resource consumption. Yes. And until we have that, a jail which could still access K-min lo load kernel modules and so on, they aren't... Uh, redundant because they serve a different uh, purpose. That is true, but don't we already have that capability? As far as I know, no. You uh, can't disable if... all the privilege restrictions uh, jails normally contain. I think certain things like accessing came in, lo loading kernel modules, uh, and so on. Certain privileges you can't ah. preserve in, in a jail. Something li yeah, like, for example, right. if you wanted to uh, run the X server on, in a jail, this is often a problem because it, at least historically, it used to require a lot of uh, dangerous uh, features like memory mapping with GPU yeah. registers, which contain uh, DMA engine controllable through this memory range so that you could bypass the MMU. Yeah, it, it was terrible. <laughs> I mean, how, how X server used to work. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, until we have jails that, until we can have jails that do not and... really have any restrictions and only track resources, you're right, they are not entirely redundant. But and the I other thing is that, um, yeah. Uh, I d think uh, the set is set locking class uh, so uh, privileged. Yes, it is. What? Yes. So, and it's yeah. really supposed to be privileged. This is kind <laughs> of a root only API. Yeah, which makes sense, but because if you could change it to anything, 
it would be easy to uh, get out of this tracking. Um, I thought a bit about what, how um, at least uh, jails containing only unprivileged processes could look like. And the best uh, and probably simplest change I can think of is to add a new system call uh, jail attach UID GID or something, which takes not just a jail ID, but also at least a primary user and group ID. And it would probably make sense to also pass uh, a number of uh, secondary groups. So that it pa as part of one atomic system call, a process would attach to the jail and drop privileges. So that there's no point where a privileged process in a jail where P trace is allowed and so on could uh, catch a process in some trampoline or something between uh, two system calls and stop it from dropping prefs. Why not just call jail attach as the user and then not do anything with UID? Uh, because right now jail attach is a privileged operation as far as I know. Uh, yeah, but eventually. Of course, eventually, but the system call I proposed would be a trivial extension of what could be could already be done. There is no lookup required because the privileged process from outside the jail would provide numeric values only. So no translation and lookup required. And it would only be a, a very simple sequence of system calls put into one atomic uh, transaction. So uh, I can't see any reason why it would uh, be problematic to add this because it shouldn't at new attack surface is like exhausting some resource you couldn't have exhausted before or requiring uh, large changes to um, non-trivial code sections or something like the go to riddle prison.c. It yeah. would only be a new system call preventing this process and its threats from progressing until they're all inside the jail. Mm, yes, but that means the creation of the jail needs still to be privileged. So yes, uh, uh, this wouldn't solve the part of starting a jail unprivileged. Only the feature to make it possible to make sure a jail never contains a privileged process once the jail has been created by a privileged process on the host. Yeah. So. It's only uh, how do you avoid race conditions in the system call ABI? Mm. If the jail doesn't contain any privileged processes, what race conditions are there? Because an uh, unprivileged process is not going to be able to, to p-trace the privileged, p -trace a privileged one. That's true. Um, if you do are very careful, you're right. If you're uncaring, uh, you may access maybe if you start a shell and it runs uh, the uh, startup configuration, if you run system or something and the shell executes something before this, or you start a child process before dropping process, you shouldn't do that, you're right, but it's just a way to make sure that it's easy to get it right. Okay. It's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that a new system call is really the avenue we want just to no, no. protect users from their own bad programming. It's just, uh, I'm not saying that this is the way to go. It would still leave the problem open of uh, creating the jail in the first place. But it yeah. could be an intermediate step with little ongoing to get jail managers there if they have some kind of support demon in user space, which remains privileged, so that maybe you could delegate for them. If it's enabled by default in some future versions, it could be a socket, a unique socket interface, but it would of course be nicer if you could just uh, have a 
system call, which isn't privileged. But there we get into things like what happens if some user tries to exhaust uh, the jail IDs or just create a, a few billion jails or other, other resources which could be exhausted to the kernel by doing that. Are there any new attack surfaces? Do we have a list of jail resources that would need to be uh somehow counted, kept track of. Do users like, need something like a per user jail limit? Um, yeah, but I mean in the in the kernel itself. So for example, with unprivileged truths, we don't really have any any special uh, resource counters or anything like that. Um, and I'm wondering what would we need uh, for JS? How are they different? Because there's a whole bunch of things that are attached to the jail, but I'm not sure if we have an exhaustive list of what actually is there and what we need to pay attention to. I just glanced at the code a while ago and it wasn't obvious. Yeah. Maybe Jamie can say something, but um, it's probably a new question for him as well. <laughs> the uh, the best I could come up with offhand is there's a function in kernjail.c. I don't recall what it's called offhand, but like jail priv check, something like that. That you know when you're doing any privileged operation, it decides whether or not jails block it, and it's not really a uh, exhaustive list of what per, what a jail can do can, that can cause problems. It's I think it's more arranged as a uh, list of what jails are allowed, still allowed to do, but mm. I, I allowing you to blacklist or whitelist oriented thing. Is that the privileges thing? Yeah. Priv like, this, um, I mean, yeah, but this isn't exactly what I've meant. So okay. this is for privileged actions allowed within jail. So to be, yeah. we're talking about in privileged jails, which means there will be no privileged actions available within jail at all because there won't be any super user process within the jail. Right. Uh, I'm also assuming that we inherit the uh, the security uh, model of of unproved truths, which means we only allow this when the no new proofs flag is set. This essentially disables set IDs and uh, it's there's no way to turn it off. So once you set this flag and then execute a set ID binary, you will not get the set ID behavior. So, uh, and this is required to make sure city ID program cannot be tricked with a weird path so that it would try to execute something. It's not what it thought it was. Um, but my, hello. Uh, my question was what resources are there? So if we gave, okay. gave normal user ability to create jails without any kind of privileges, so jail attached stops being super user only with some with some limitations of course. Uh, what kind of harm can the user do to the system? I'm assuming they probably can DOS it somehow, uh, which is local, so it might be trollable, uh, but are there any potential security gotchas or something that could uh, interfere with super user, like global super user, uh, in a way different than resource exhaustion, like for example, keeping something busy, pre preventing something from being killed, things like that. Mostly, I'm, I just think in resource exhaustion would be more than anything else. I mean, as long as you're not raising the permissions, you know, most of what, for example, you know, the jail command line does things like, you know, moving interfaces and VNet and things along those lines, they all require permissions of their own. They're done from outside the jail. 
Because there might be something might... with ZFS because I'm not really mm -hmm. too uh, clear on the things that ZFS allows with their jail interface. I mean, because once we like agree that the, this is a safe thing to do, um, adding unprivileged truth functionality was like a 10 lines of death. And I think unprivileged, unprivileged jails shouldn't be much more complicated, at least in first iteration. Just loosen some checks, add the check for no new proofs uh, to make sure you cannot uh, exploit set UIDs and that might be it. So one thing I was thinking about, um, if jails are supposed to replace um, or yeah, succeed locking classes, they would um, also need to be protected from other users so that I can't uh, get all the CPU time or IO bandwidth or whatever on a shared system by joining some uh, jail I'm not supposed to be in. So, if, and then the next question is who gets to uh, basically define the hierarchical resource limitations on them? Because if you kind of want someone to be able to delegate resources to a user and then have this user dedicate his resources to an unprivileged jail of his own creation, probably. So, that in that case, the jail would need someone who owns it, maybe the unprivileged UID, which is allowed to manage it or something. Yeah, that's um, a good point. And in that case, or should jails just be expected to have to opt in to uh, or provide a list of UIDs or GIDs, which are allowed to in addition to the privileged uh, one to access it. So what's a good interface for it? Huh. You mean uh, for uh, cases when you call jail attach not to create a new jail, but to attach it yourself to an existing one? So let's say I want to write some FreeBSD uh, specific sandboxing in a multi-user application, something like a mail server or something I want. And it's I want to make use of this feature to provide better isolation and defense in depth. So I add it and now maybe I need a group of users allowed to manage this jail or the processes inside it. So maybe, so how should that look at the system call level? to keep implementation complexity low while enabling everything we want to enable. And not, push. Yeah, not even just from a system call level, but from a uh, kernel bookkeeping level. And yeah. this uh, point that was raised about Jamie, I think you dropped out, at least for me. Can anyone still hear him? Uh, his Michael, image froze. Yeah, I unmuted. Uh, his image froze, so maybe he's having internet trouble. Or his system kicked into updates. I don't know. We'll give him a moment. Who wants to drop him a message in IRC? Maybe we just cut out for him as well. He probably knows, but go ahead and hit him there. He's still technically on the call. Um, press unmute. And rename. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like his connection's having trouble. I guess I can't unmute him after I muted him. Uh, and oh, I reconnecting. Great. Welcome back, Jamie. You currently have two sessions. I might be able to boot the first one, but neither is moving. Okay, I think I'm back. 
Welcome. Uh, the old me, I guess, can be gotten rid of. <laughs> uh, video is not working for either. Let's see. I'm going to, I think I have the right one. Let's see if I can do that. I will not report you. <laughs> okay, do I have the right one? Jamie, can you hear us? Yes. Great. Okay, go ahead. Your video is frozen, but it's your call. Okay. You That's okay. The, the video is nothing but, you know, me talking head anyway. In fact, I might as well just join the group of people with that video stay the bandwidth. Uh, anyway, yeah, the, the point that was raised about users making jails to escape per user restrictions, um, that means that the kernel is going to have to know which jails are should be considered part of a user in another in the other jail as as far as their bookkeeping goes, you know, CPU limits, things like that. That that's a uh, entire bookkeeping mess that we don't have right now. Right now, jails are considered completely independent from their parents in so many of these ways. And you know, now we have to say, yeah, this is this is a user jail where someone you know made a jail and just became that user in the jail. Whereas this other thing, on the other hand, is a user jail where a user joined a jail and is still using resources as that user just inside a jail. And how do those look different in the kernel? And are they really different kinds of jails, different kinds of things attached to user processes? You know, what point do we track that? One of the things I was thinking when the idea of a non-privileged jail was first created was, oh, it's just a jail that runs with the same UID as me, but no. There's all kinds of root processes that run in a jail, or, or are we thinking of something else? Yeah, I think we're thinking of just a jail that runs with the same user ID as you and doesn't have those root processes. It, you know, it's a very minimal jail that just has, yeah. you know, maybe the one process or something like that. Yep. Basically, so, uh, everything runs as UID DVL, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. That would uh, limit you a bit. I was assuming that there would be a, at least a fixed set of users per uh, this jail. Maybe we want something else to notice a jail and enter it. Maybe something like a lock collector or something should be able to get into the jail and collect from all instances of a service if you want to support multi-tenancy. Yeah, okay, that, that's still, yeah. Something like- has, Or maybe magnifies the bookkeeping question yeah. of keeping track of user limits and jail limits and how they mix. Are, are these separate sub-projects though? Because for, first you need a jail. And then you can start working on all the other things. I'm I'm assuming that they can be separated into different distinct things. And if yes, someone okay. doesn't want want the jail that doesn't have the facilities to restrict to a single user or whatever, um, you know, we're hold on, Jan. We're, we're trying to create a jail that runs as a non-privileged user, and we can create that. And it'll fill needs that some people have, but it won't fit, fill everyone's needs. But the first step is to create the jail that fits some needs, I think. I'm done. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and because exactly that's a good question. The problem is if we try to uh, model it all, all out, you get a problem, a uh, project which will never be finished. So how can this be broken down? Which workflows should be uh, enabled? Is any additional tracking required or basically would it be enough to just uh, uh, remove this privilege check? Uh, how should the uh, API ABI look like? So for example, I could see that it would already be useful to just be able to um, 
require jails to at create time set a flag and implicitly create uh, set it if the jail is created by an unprivileged process that it's allowed to be entered by unprivileged processes so that an existing jail manager running or jail.conf and the jail base system command uh, running as root isn't affected its jails are still protected from the non-privileged users and only the jails setting this flag or maybe requiring this flag to be set if you want to create a unprivileged jail only this would uh, be added and nothing would be lost from the point of isolating existing jail configurations making it into a full replacement for locking classes could be the next step if it's ever taken Who has... there's, there's two different things okay. here. Um, jails that you create as a user that you can also attach to as that user, but you also talk about jails that you can create as a non-privileged user that other non-privileged users can attach to. And I didn't consider this separate things right now. Uh, a jail isn't owned by a user. It is its own thing. It only It's only a container of processes, according to my understanding. It's a set of processes uh, and yeah. restrictions to apply to it. If this metadata for the set now is just extended to a flag allowing either a certain UID or GID or whatever to operate on it and join it by passing the normal, at least if you had a jail create or the option just to set a property on a jail, defining which UIDs or GIDs are allowed to attach to it in addition to the privileged one, which would be implicitly part of this state. That would already enable jails to work for uh, unprivileged users within the normal restrictions applied to them. So they couldn't just without a set UID binary allowed to work as set UID binary in the jail um switch uids inside the jail and even so if they had it and the file system is accessible outside the prison then you could uh, already run the set uid executable on the host and become the user id there so there's no new attack surface making it possible to maybe translate all uids to the one of the jail and have a single UID jail is a totally different uh, feature set to that. Or the what was discussed last week, uh, remapping uh, ranges of UIDs or restricting jails to a certain range of UIDs. This would of course require a privileged operation because you have to partition the UID or in GID namespace for that. So I would, have considered that out of scope for a, at least for a first iteration of removing the privilege requirement. Do we have known use cases where someone present says, wow, I wish I could do this and exactly this and let's mm. you know, start there? So uh, it would be nice for build systems. So a CI CD pipeline could have a jail per uh, job because one of the things which jails are is a reliable way to track a set of processes, uh, which those processes can't escape, which is otherwise often lacking, especially in an unprivileged fashion. So that I can make sure that they're in a race free way ensure that the last process of something has died. And there's not some process still lingering somewhere or high, a fork bomb still running at a actually a i believe we might have that problem with jail still that killing the jail might not be entirely reliable if the jail is destroyed there are no processes left which have been part of the jail. 
it may be that you okay. can stop the jail from being destroyed, but if it is destroyed, it is destroyed. Okay. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, you know, any problems that we've had with uh, fork bombs and things like that in jails is there still may be a window where a new process can be in mid fork when the jail is being destroyed and keep the jail alive. But yes, the jail will be seen as alive. You will definitely it's dying right no you Not will definitely alive. know if a jail still has processes because it will be shown as being a an existing living jail there will not be a process where a, a condition where a jail has processes and you do not see the jail as existing something related which would make jails nicer to program against in a again, very secure fashion, would be some kind of jail file descriptor type, similar to a process descriptor. Yeah, more broadly, I think pretty much anything in the kernel that has single numeric space IDs should be uh, moving more toward a descriptor model. So I, yeah, I don't see jails as being different from all the rest of these that should have that. I, I, I like the idea of descriptors. They aren't. Because like processes, jails can come and go and your number might be stale. But you still want to, them to have a number for debugging purposes. And yeah, we'll still have a number. Scripting yes, and so on. Because, or at least a way to access them by some kind of stable-ish identifier. Well, it's dead. The stableish identifier would be jail names. Jail names, jail I mean, ideas. Yes, you can you can certainly destroy a jail, make one under a new name, but at mm -hmm. least in that case, you have a better idea that that was intentional, and it yes. was in some way the same jail, at exactly. least from an administrative viewpoint. And exactly, a name we use is probably intentional. Jail ID we use, well, not really. It's. Pretty close to intentional. I mean, the jail ID space is very large compared to the effort it takes to create and destroy jails. Yeah, but I've seen them on some of my build machines in the tens of thousands, so it's still a long way away from... Yes, it, it certainly could happen. But much, much more likely than name reuse. Well, than unintentional name reuse. Unintentional name reuse seems to... Well, yeah. depending on... What program you have creating jails certainly uh, could happen then, but it's a preventable problem. So uh, there's a kernel module in ports, which has been mentioned multiple times here, that uh, makes jails produce uh, event notifications to the DevCTL device about jail creation and destruction. Like with K-Event or something? Uh, through the through the uh, DevCTL mechanism for hot plugging devices and so on in the new mm. namespace. Seems so. a strange fit for a software only thing to be using the device interface. Well, it's also used for link state notifications, uh, creating PTYs, stuff like this. Um, normally it's used for device hot plugging, for example, to automatically load firmware to your wireless card or something. Yeah. But it's also uh, used for starting the DHCP uh, server or to for loading the WireGuard configuration onto a newly would, created WireGuard device. I would sort there's also notification for things like carp role change. Yes. So yeah. But it's mostly used for devices, including pseudo devices or ZFS snapshot, uh, check some error notifications, but, but right hey. now this is what is available and a file descriptor would also solve this as a way to have it be monitored via K event. Yeah. And have your build server watch over it without resorting to polling. 
And the problem with the DevCTL interface is because it's a, a lossless stream from kernel to user space. There can be only one consumer because if you supported an arbitrary number of consumers allowed to block, the kernel would have to buffer infinite, potentially unbounded messages. And because of that, also the DevD daemon only supports a certain number of proxied consumers. As, which, if I remember correctly, it supports up to 10 uh, downstream consumers, again, to limit uh, the resource and latency problems here. But like I mentioned before, the, this is probably not required because we can get away with um, counting how often the event occurred. And you only want to know that this state transition occurred at least once since the last time you consumed it. So oh, let's take a wireless uh, interface um, connecting to some network as an example. I don't care if I dropped out three or five times. I only care that I reconnected at least once and some collection of scripts should respond to this. And that said, do you have a minimum set of requirements for this feature? Mm. So, um, what can everyone agree on? It's early, early really really date. Make a jails observable. Make them observable. Um, the, my preferred way would be a readiness on some file descriptor if there's a change similar to how process descriptors work in k-event. Yeah, that, that seems the best model. That's, Jails and processes uh, have the same, a lot of the same uh, properties. Yeah. Basically, take the process descriptor design choices and apply them to jail IDs in Jails. Yeah. And don't uh, attack the remapping of user IDs inside containers or the translation at the file system level through a UMAP file system like it used to exist up to FreeBSD 7 uh, for now, because it's a larger project which digs deeply into uh, the guts of how permissions and privileges work. But if we want to go through some kind of proxy, the next thing, which is quite in, could be quite invasive, would be some kind of, again, new file descriptor type for privileges. So that you get, basically have a privilege uh, file descriptor type allowing you to have a reference of, I want to snapshot a certain set of privileges and apply it somewhere. So, if you had some kind of JLD with per uh, UID jails, you would say, these are the pr privileges I want you to use, uh, unless you're certain that they can all be um, serialized. And you, but the nice thing about such a file descriptor type is that you could seal them in, uh, protecting them from, basically from spoofing this capability, you would, add a new type of capability to the system, which is probably a non-trivial change. But it would be nice to have in other contexts as well, something like a cron daemon or a built a pipeline again. Yeah, that, that seems a, uh, a kind of orthogonal thing, a permissions description. Formal, uh, completely orthogonal if we get it right. Uh, but it would uh, play nice with it. Yeah, just seems a little outside of. I mean, I, I can see how it yeah could go along, but it's also it's kind a of problem a big because you could uh, hide some privilege that way in a new way, maybe because you could keep. It's sealed in this file descriptor through a 
otherwise privilege uh, separation, uh, privilege um, droppings, code sequence. Like you could set your EU ID, your ID, and so on, and still preserve this privilege uh, in a file descriptor because it's a capability and you wouldn't lose the capability, which is a new thing to think about. Yeah, Gosh. anytime you're messing with uh, permissions. Especially yeah, because be file tight. descriptors normally can be passed across uh, process boundaries through sockets, which is one of the things which would make it so powerful, but also a new attack surface. Yeah. Yeah, I'd want to uh, get the uh, security expert community on anything like that. So what is actionable from that discussion at this time, if anything? And Jan, did that cover all of your design ideas or do you have- No, it doesn't. Ones? I'm sure you have a million. <laughs> um, but my design ideas are more restricted to what's available right now, not adding uh, new features to the kernel, but making use of existing APIs and ABIs in creative ways. Do you have a simple example? Not really, because I don't have code. I only have a whiteboard. Okay. <laughs> the idea is uh, basically three uh, cooperating demons. One acting as a place to store and retrieve file descriptors by name, so just holding on to file descriptors on behalf of other processes. And then one uh, implementing the concept of an observable state where uh, I, my current idea is to reuse um, sealed anonymous memory to, uh, the, to store the current state and then allow basically events to to be counted on them but, uh, and observers to subscribe to certain events on the state uh, with the option of blocking until they're acknowledged. This could be done through the, I think, through the creative uh, use of the already existing um, event uh, file descriptor type where you would ask the uh, state daemon to uh, pass you back a, a counter file descriptor wrapped in capsicum uh, capability so that you can only read it and not uh, write to it, but still can you add it to your event loop. That way, if it uh, is incremented by the state daemon, you see it as ready uh, and you don't read the counter value, which implicitly resets the counter until you are done processing the event. Is that the What's second a, or third uh, item? Go ahead. Yes. What's Jamie, an existing uh, thing that has a counter like uh, that? There's that an, uh, uh, the existing thing we got from the Linux later, but it's now available outside of it is the event FD. It's a file, new file descriptor type. Um, it's created with the event FD uh, system call. There are two wrappers uh, called event FD read and write, but they are just uh, wrappers around uh, eight byte read and write system call in libc. And there are different ways to use them as counting semaphores. Uh, in non-blocking and blocking fashion. The uh, man page in FreeBSD 13.0 and newer describes how they can be used. And they support uh, KQ, Paul, and select. So they can be used with existing event loops. Basically, it's a 
cleaner solution than the um, signal pipe. I don't, you've made, you, some of you have probably seen the signal pipe, like you uh, used in certain demons as a workaround to signal state from a signal handler to an event loop, where you write the signal number to a pipe or a character to a pipe. Do you have an example, Damon? Um, the demon tools, uh, supervisors. Um, I don't, I know that they do it for certain and others have done it. So the thing is that you're, Almost no function is async signal safe, but system calls R and writing a small fixed size value to a pipe is about the most you can securely do in a portable way um, in a signal handler context. So if you want to do have the event loop, notice that the signal has been handled and inspect it, then you can't uh, call something like uh, pthread uh, condition variable signaling or something, you, but you can write to a pipe, but the problem with the pipe is that it actually buffers the information written. So if you write to it and the, there's no consumer on it the other end, then the buffer fills up until at, you either block or it gets dropped on a uh, non-blocking file descriptor. And we don't need to track the history. We only need to track the, the state basically has happened or has not yet happened per um, event on the state. Basically something like a jail has been prepared, created, pre-started, post-started and so on. And some kind of controller supposed to be managing those jails doesn't care that, or shouldn't care that something has be, happened several times if it uh, was, uh, for example, stopped because someone sent it a sick stop. It should only catch up to the current state and notice that, oh, I have to inspect the state. It doesn't have to, do it in the order and the number of times, it should all be indempotent in a reliable system. That's a, do I have your three points covered in the minutes if you're watching the minutes? Uh, I'm not watching the minutes. But the other one would be a user space jail daemon, um, which would uh, implement the state machine in user space by using only persistent jails and using the file descriptor holding daemon to save its intent log basically to a, either a file or a piece of anonymous memory. It would say, I'm trying to do this. And then later it would say, okay, I finished doing this. Now this is the state and so on. So that even if you kill it, it could uh, be restarted and pick up where it left. And using persistent jails, you, you should be able to solve most of the problems of these two unsynchronized state machines with um, automatic jail lifetimes. So the kernel is uh, in charge of garbage collecting the jail as soon as there are no processes left in it. And the Reason for wanting the three processes that it enables uh, M to N uh, multiplexing between uh, controllers and jails. Well, maybe you have one controller for one aspect of a system, for example, assigning alias IP addresses to jails or creating their uh, ePair interfaces. And another one for handling the mount points or whatever you need so more than a more. single jail demon yes so that you could have that you don't have to have a monolith so that you could have a, something handling only one part of the network or what something only handling making available the syslog socket or something like that in the jail so that you have a lock collector and the network uh, set up and tear down uh, into totally different processes 
which are only synchronized through these events uh, but, and can either consume them in a blocking or non-blocking fashion. So either they only kill that, oh, this happened at least once, I should react in some way, or no, this jail cannot progress until I'm done. Mm, it may be possible, mm. we're thinking this, uh, to do it with right access to directories of symlinks to hook scripts and so on. But I think this is more flexible. And if you want, and you also want the uh, state demon to probably spawn off the handlers to these events potentially, maybe by passing file descriptors to executables, uh, argument vectors, and and sending the argument and environment vectors in memfds so that you can have a completely uh, descriptor-based uh, interface to the socket. What would those other example daemons be? You mentioned network. Uh, one for holding onto file descriptors, one for tracking uh, and observing state, either by spawning off um, hooks on change or in allowing others to observe the state changes without resorting to a polling. Thank you. And these are basically daemons implementable through existing uh, system calls, which would implement a mechanism for expressing policies. So it's that what I want to avoid is locking uh, people into a specific implementation. Like I don't want to become the jail manager to supplant all jail managers or something. It's that it should be it should play nice with anyone who wants to participate. Have simple, stable interfaces and make it possible to interact with the software without having to basically be closely tied to it. I want to avoid these kinds of lock-in effects or breaking existing configurations because that way you get bad blood, like for example, system D. But even something like system D though, it's still, there is value in a single supported jail demon existing rather than saying, um, yeah, the kernel allows this, roll your own. Yes, there's value in standardizing on things. There is little value in forcing a specific flawed, incomplete implementation down everyone's throat. So, uh, so this is again the problem with something like system D. Yes, there's value in what they're doing. There's a reason why people accepted it despite all of its flaws. Because there was so much uh, potential for improvement, but in some ways the cure is worse than the disease with system D. Okay. And one of the reasons is that it, it has to be in charge of things. And what I described doesn't have to be. It only has to be in charge of what it manages. Okay. It's opt-in only. Uh, Goran, any thoughts based on your experiences? Sorry, I'm just tonight. So. Tonight, so. Someone's got their, Someone's got their speaker going. going. You have a lot of echo. Yeah, and I can hear it beside myself. Anyway, um, I was doing more, uh, well, it, it's somewhat kernel space, but envy list. I got into this idea to convert between UCL and envy list. And ideally provide the functions to the base um, in contributing them. And it would be nice if we would have uh, Envilist as, uh, as a center point of uh, conversion. 
meaning that if you implement your program to add stuff from your config, from a custom configuration format in Tanvil list, that it's one-to-one -one, uh, representable by UCL and thus UCL can emit the, the config in UCL format. So it, it's a really nice and romantic idea, but it's missing pieces. It, it's missing some types that UCL has and analyst doesn't. And I'm currently working on uh, adding float as a, as a type. I talked to, I think it's Marius Zaborski, uh, but I really have a problem remembering names, so I might be wrong. Uh, anyway, he agreed that float would be nice to have in the envy list so that we can pass it around. Uh, there is still, after float, there is at least type called time. I'm not sure how it's represented in UCL. Uh, well, once I get to it. So most of my research for, uh, recently went into the envy list and how to represent anything from UCL with it. Now there is, even if I implement time and float, there is one problem for the universal Envil list um, type set, let's call it that. Uh, and that is that number, that uh, type called the number in Envil list is an unsigned 64 bit integer. It would be really nice to have the unsigned, uh, unsigned and signed version of it. Uh, you can imagine that UCL can uh, parse something as a positive or negative number, but by casting it into the envelope list, we use the signness. We can kind of guess, and if we're making our own implementation of some program, we know when to cost and how, but in a universal global kind, it would be really nice to have a sign preserved. So that, that's mostly what I've been researching and I know that Beehive uses Envelist. Uh, recently I saw email by Christoph about PF switching to Envilist. So it is more and more present in the FreeBSD free free base. Uh, so that's, that's basically what I'm researching. Jamie, go ahead and mute. I think your speaker is feeding back. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Please try it again, go on. Okay, so you, uh, you say Christoph had some, uh, was that Provost has some feedback or is using it in PF or where? Uh, yeah, the Christoph uh, wrote about breaking change in PF in order to support um, new features and uh, uh, I guess new uh, messages between the PFCTL and the kernel implementation. Uh, I didn't read the code. I, I'm just guessing from my experience with Envilist is that if you have a mental image of a JSON, you can put anything in it. And that's basically Envilist. So I'm guessing that Christoph did it to support arbitrary, uh, not arbitrary, sorry, future arguments to the uh, to the kernel uh, of uh, Cisco and uh, Envilist. Uh, I know Beehive is using Envilist all around. So uh, I can see the slow trend of uh, um, leaning towards Envilist. So I, I took it uh, for um, 
for my homework to research more and implement if something is needed. Uh, right now I have a little skeleton project that does only one way, uh, meaning that it forces UCL, stores it in uh, Envelis and emits it with uh, Excel. So ideally what I would love to, well, already have in base, but here we are, uh, is to have a UCL to Envelis uh, function that converts and the other way around and something probably that's gonna be called like Excel emit envy list that can emit the, the envy list to the terminal in whatever Excel supports. Uh, ideally making it really easy to, to switch to envy list and UCL in one go if you have from something older like we do have at jail for and uh, ideally well not ideally uh, i mean i'm gonna do it anyway uh, i want to experiment with how to pass and the list to the jail kernel, uh, kernel side of the jail and create and store stuff uh, using Envy list because I want to experiment. And if in any point parts of it or whole or something in between becomes interesting enough and good enough for the uh, base, for the for official tree, I don't mind submitting it. But at this point, uh, I am not sure I have no experience that says what I'm dreaming about actually should be done in such a way. So I, I'm having a much more research before I do that, but I, I'm hoping that we will bring and release to the jail uh, one way or another. And uh, what I'm aiming for is keeping the configuration in the kernel of a running jail that it was started with. So that we can, for example, the dumbest example is create a jail from a file, uh, remove the file and currently we stop it. There is post stop or, <coughs> sorry, EPR destroying that is, lost and it's not gonna be done. Uh, so that, that's something I would like to research and, and uh, I will uh, just, I'm really at the beginning of my journey right now. That's it. Uh, Goran, I will try to ask John, perhaps tomorrow on the developer's call for Beehive, if he ran into any missing uh, types. And if you can join, that'd be great. But uh, he does his best to join. That's a very good point. Do you have a, can you think of any other types that might be missing? Um, so let's uh, see, I've got the float, we've got the time, was it, or unsigned and unsigned? I think, actually, no, I, I don't think that there's a email that Marius uh, sent me. Uh, Earlier implementation of Envy list in the uh, in the base had all from eight sixteen thirty two and sixty four bit integers signed and unsigned and maybe something else I, I forgot. So for the reasons of uh, storage, I guess, only 64-bit version uh, was preserved. And for some reason, it's unsigned. When you're creating your own program uh, and you just store your integer in the older, it's gonna be 32-bit and signed, you can still convert it there and back, right? Because you know the logic, you know what that value means. And then it has to be signed or it has to be unsigned. 
Uh, so mostly programs don't have a problem I'm hitting. And that is how do I do it so universally that anything can be just uh, converted, for example, from UCL to Envilist and back and emit it as a configuration. That, that's really not a common scenario for Envilist and I might be pushing it to the limit with this. Um, I think what's happening is that you want a generic solution for completely unknown data, whereas probably all existing applications of libNV are for a known but potentially extendable schema. So something like preserving the signness of a value isn't required because the kernel developer is comfortable just assuming that they know if this is a signed or unsigned integer because they kind of have the implicit knowledge about the schema on both sides. They just don't want to tie down the concrete uh, representation of the values in a way that they can't extend the ABI later without breaking either side. So having new keys in your uh, libNV object means that now at least an old consumer doesn't know what to do with them and can either ignore them or say they are in a mandatory uh, wrapper. So now I have to re reject the whole thing. And you can do this in a backward and forward compatible way. Whereas uh, if you don't embed any schema, you have to preserve this type information. You can bypass this restriction by doing your own minimal meta schema where you have kind of a type you would encode as a binary with a, a tagged union containing all the uh, fixed size types you may want to uh, exchange, like uh, one character for the type uh, followed by the type's binary representation in memory. Uh, as a tech union in C, and then you only need to know that this can be the thing and that it's a binary you can decode. But it, of course, this isn't a clean solution. This is working around the limitations of the existing library. And if you can, it would be nice to add those types. It's a question, okay. do you want to add all the fixed size types or just the maximum sized ones? Like, do you want an int max and unsigned int max only, or do you want a, a 16 bit signed integer type as well? That's a conversation to have with perhaps Marius, John Baldwin, Paul Dowdeck, who mm -hmm. spoke about them at uh, the Open ZFS Developer Summit. So that's getting a little orthogonal, but, um, it, that may indeed be an overdue conversation, but now is not the time. So let's, you know, if if someone wants, you know, for, for example, Gorin, if you want to just brainstorm that list, just go ahead and do that and present it because it's totally valid. Um, that said, we are at over an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, let's see, Edward, anything else? Dan, anything else, Mohammed, who haven't spoken as much? <clears throat> well, I'm the, I, I think I'm even more newbie than and you and standard newbie, so I would rather listen and learn first. Understood. Yeah. And you are encouraged to do so. I had to disappear for a while, so I may have missed something. I, I think the main thing to keep in mind is that if you want to have uh, breaking down the project, Someone said uh, obtainable goals, um, a jail that runs as a non-privileged user. Once you get that, others can build upon it, but until we get to that point, it's difficult for anything else to happen, I think. I, I have a problem with the term terminology because a jail doesn't have a user right now, and it wouldn't have one in a minimal implementation either. Having a, sure. a user sure is the property of a process, not of the jail. 
Okay, I understood. We've talked about, we, we've talked about, I understand the, the concept, but I think we know what we're talking about. We have talked about lots of potential uh, designs or about the design space. So it's kind of important to stay on point, but I, the minimal unprivileged jail would be very useful already. Yeah. Okay. And I highlighted in bold, and I'll make the minimum requirements bold mid document of make jails observable by via file descriptors that uh, is for different event the handling minimal one that would be the okay. next one after the unprivileged jail oh, okay and my, then if i had to choose i see okay so uh one unprivileged jail um so fundamentally is and i recall from edward that in principle an unprivileged jail is not too different from an a cheroot with housekeeping I'm in no position to say. Uh, so I do encourage everyone to think about what that looks like in practice. Uh, we do have three or so points oh. of where it gets starting and maybe we do need a, just a design doc that we each review as a group and, uh, and uh, contribute to. Go ahead. Uh, what if we require that uh, to create an unprivileged jail, that jail must not be persistent? That, because uh, then it hold will. Hold on, let only, him finish. Uh, so then uh, the kernel will guarantee that it will only exist as long as the process that created it exists. No. Nope. Uh, so then we I'll don't let him need finish. to to track uh, owners for, for jails, just for the, the process. Um, you're making invalid assumptions. And one of them is that a jail contains only one process and that a privileged user can't attach to your jail. Okay, so if I have a so, non-persistent -per jail, um, another user attaches to it and my original process exits. Exits. What happens then? The jail happily lives on until the last process uh, contained in it dies. Okay. So making mm -hmm. a jail persistent only disables this kind of garbage collection. Yeah. Or reference counting. Yeah. And even an unprivileged jail should be able to fork an exec. So you would almost always have more than one process in a jail over its lifetime. Mm, true. So the assumption you're making that you have some kind of parent process which uniquely identifies a user and which is always available and isn't valid. You can't go yeah. from a jail to the one true process representing its user. So but as what it is you now, could do is mm -hmm. extend the prison struct to include a sorted list of user IDs and group IDs allowed to attach to it and um, allow unprivileged uh, users to create jails only if either their primary group or um, user ID is included in this list. Okay, so as it is now, the struct jail doesn't have any way of tracking which user created it, right? It doesn't because it's implicitly always a privileged yeah, user. Right. Yeah, okay. And something mm -hmm. else I want to look out for is to preserve the semantics of existing jails. Or, so the existing system call semantics shouldn't be changed in an incompatible way. So that, for example, if I have a jail set up on a server, updating to the next version of FreeBSD, if we ever get this in base, shouldn't add a new thing to watch out for or break some 
assumption someone relies on, like for example, that the unprivileged users on the parent can't attach to random jails as this user, because maybe you all run something with very relaxed uh, permissions under a root directory, um, which is inaccessible to these users normally. And you basically had a parent directory the user couldn't go through because it's only for this dedicated jail user ID and the privileged user to. And if we, you now could magically enter the jail, you maybe could do some harm in there. Jan, are your- You have to I... opt into this. Are your ideas clear enough to write them down and we run through them or your concerns at least? They're very good observations. Um, Let me check. So maybe take take a moment before the next meeting to just yep. bang out what, will... you know, what, if anything, what not to do. I get that because you're, you're identifying some good points. Um, but yeah, I, you know things like the the polar violation of breaking existing jails is I, I trust pretty universal here. Um, but I think our authorities are Jamie and Edward especially. So yes. if I hope this is useful to you, I'll say that. And as we approach an hour and a half, any other thoughts and observations at this stage? I think we have a lot to digest here and it's moderately well documented. Yeah, so I have a question. Please. Does any have, yeah? Go ahead with your question, absolutely. Uh, does anyone have a recent experience with union FS? Does it work? How does it work? Any gotchas? Um, it does work to mount a writable file system on top of a read-only file system. At least it did in 12 and 13 for me. Uh, you may want to ask the Pot and Bastille Jail Manager community. Um, uh, because sorry, which community? Uh, Pot and Basti BSD, uh, two jail uh, managers. Yeah. Um, they do support this for overlays. So, for example, Pot supports either a nullfs uh, to mount a data directory in there or um, to delegate a jail data set into it, to the a ZFS data set into the jail. And it hasn't failed me, but I've mostly used it in the, the last few years for, um, I've used it for doing um, shared state in a flat directory or very simple. I haven't tried to combine multiple writable file systems. I've only basically mounted a subtree on top of something instead of trying to merge them. From what I've heard, if you modify a lower file system, you might have trouble. And mm -hmm. Edward, do you have follow-up ideas that led to that question? So the warnings at the end of the man page, they aren't really all that true, right? It, it generally mm -hmm. works. Uh, they are case, true. When there's only one writable. Or at least they used to be uh, true. And I haven't done anything to recheck them. If the uh, underlay is writable and non-empty and so on. So, and the other complexity is that only UFS supports write-out files, which are a special mm -hmm. file type to mark a file in the overlay as deleted to hide a file in the underlay without actually deleting it. Uh, ZFS doesn't have a file type for this similar to how it doesn't track the user immutable flag in, uh, you know, it's just not encoded. Do you know if TempFS supports it? A whiteout? I don't think so. I think it's really only in uh, UFS. Um, 
but the, a quick grab may be enough to find out or, or test. But yeah, but still, I think this is not not critical. I wonder if perhaps someone should update the man page to explain that, for example, that it's only the one specific weird scenario that mm, it's kind of dangerous. I know that at mass toned down the language there, but I, it, I think we've brought this up in the past. It, we're definitely due for a simple test suite to say, OK, here are a bunch of operations and let's see if they blow up that we can consistently reproduce because the question does keep coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone has like 20 minutes to just script some blatantly obvious scenarios that might cause trouble, that would be very useful because having the sort of cloud over it without clear understanding of the risks is not helpful. Yeah. Yeah, the warning in the Mount Union FS is really strongly worded in 12, at least. Yeah, and I think Ed, uh, yeah, Ed Mass toned it down for later for current. Used to anyway. read this file system is not yet fully supported. Read, it yep, doesn't understood. work. Using it, in fact, this may destroy data on your system. Yeah, not helpful, especially if only true in like seven. Anyway, uh, other topics, questions? Jamie, especially, I hope you have some takeaways from this that are useful. I hope we can all just map out, you know, either wish lists, killer apps, especially, because if, for example, thank you, Jan, for the build environment example, because if, you know, we end up with a solution that doesn't address clear and present use mm -hmm. cases, not as helpful, or there are simple related use cases we want to document and they might be easy to incorporate. So the other example I can think of would basically be the actually usable alternative to Capsicum sandboxing for existing code bases. Oh, interesting. Something Good point. Like your browser tabs could be jailed, each origin in its own jail. And you would still. Re we, uh, retain access to shared just partition global namespaces. So your um, questionable uh, video streaming site couldn't uh, access your SSH private key file because it's jailed out of the way. Interesting. Um, stuff like this, or your the renderer of your mail client, stuff like that. It would be probably a lot easier to maintain patch sets and if eventually maybe one day upstream them to appreciative upstream projects than having them rewrite every interaction with a global namespace as is required or almost required for um, Capsicum. Because while it's not hard to write a new application with Capsicum, you have to do it most interaction with the outside world is a little bit different, so it's very invasive to retrofit into non-trivial applications. While something like a user space jail would be easier to opt in for an existing code base to Fair enough. And something like a lib uh, archive could enter a jail before it unpacks anything to make sure that it doesn't unintentionally write outside of the uh, intended target directory when unpacking an archive. Though that's true of change root as well. Yep, yes, exactly. but change root is only for one of the namespaces and less flexible. Uh not, I'm not one to argue against the flexibility and usefulness of jails. <laughs> uh, Jamie, do you have use cases? And Dan, be, you're a uh, heavy user of them. Go ahead, uh, Bian, if you have gone to wrap that up. Sure. And uh, so change would used to be privileged as well. So Good point. <laughs> the important part to make these uh, new features useful to most users is to make them available to unprivileged users by default so that someone writing 
code can rely on the availability given a certain release. Okay. But the problem is if you have to do things like set VFS user mount, uh, set permissions here, do something here and there, then to, you barely have to, un you have to be barely root on the parent, on the system and you Correct. have to have permission to change everything. And you, it's a lot harder to deploy instead of this is now a new part of a system, it's always available. You can rely on its availability. Okay, yep. Um, because otherwise you will find that if let's say you're in a large organization, you're responsible for one application and only one application or set of applications and not all the hosts. And now you have some kind, you have the grumpy old gray beard <laughs> operators who refuse to uh, turn on anything new and uh, experimental and untrusted. Yes, Jan. Just because they're too busy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, other use cases just to sort of inspire this whole effort. Uh, for example, Dan, I know you're a heavy jail user. Does anything jump out that hasn't been mentioned? So that, oh, I wish I could do this here and now with an unprivileged jail. No. Okay. Nothing and does. Nothing jumps on me. Jamie, anything in your experience? Because clearly you're our subject matter expert. I. No, I'm not an expert on use cases anymore. I've hardly ever used jails for anything more than regular virtual hosting things in a long time. Got it. Well, uh, I propose we all digest what's been discussed because it's been a really good discussion. Um, any final thoughts, observations, etc.? I will try I, to bring up those NB list questions uh, with the Beehive hubs. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that what Jan has just described, there's a review for this. It's number 383511 on publication. Can you put it in the chat, please? Yes, 38351. Um, uh, it's D38351. Oh. Okay, I will try to find that while you're doing that. Uh, mechanism for an in-kernel AT, FTC, yes. okay, da, 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 da. okay, great, thank you. Uh, that's only for the um, file system namespace, that's not for sockets, that's not for yeah. signals, and so on. But it's part of making uh, capsicum easier, easier to consume. Uh, so, Jan, your comment was doesn't handle sockets and others? The handles only one, only the file name or file path namespace. Oh, file path namespace. Okay. Other it's thoughts, the, ideas, The questions. most important one, but not the only one. Fair enough. Well, if that's it for today, I thank you all and uh, let's talk in a week. I still have an open issue with libucl with regards to macro support. In a review or in what uh, form? Uh, so far I haven't gotten a response. Um, well, it's, response, so it's what form does it take? It's a review? It's just a GitHub issue. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, about if you how have to uh, add something. Um, Let me dig out the number. The problem is that right now, the options to macros don't inherit the variables and okay. uh, callbacks register. Start with the uh, puzzle. Uh, I opened uh, the week ago. This. Okay, go ahead and post that. Let's get it in the minutes and- Exactly. Go uh, Boom, okay, thank you. Boom, uh, copy. So the thing is, I want to use variables inside the search path for other macros. Okay. Oh, there we go. And that is to the libucl repo. Great. Yep. Thank and the you very much for looking into that. Right now, there is no clean way to implement this through the uh, exported API of libucl.so. 
I can think of Arkley rock arounds to get okay. this. And if the <clears throat> paths are literals, it's not a problem. It's only a problem if you want to expand something like the jail name uh, in there. Okay. Well, uh, let's hope the author is responsive to that and do, yeah, keep keep maintaining that list of things that need to be fixed in both UCL and NVList as we get closer and closer. Because I've tried uh, writing uh, some kind of libucl loader and modeling how I would like a jail configuration in UCL syntax to look like. Okay. And right now I haven't come up with what I, I, I consider the required feature set because okay. I, I want to abstract over the jail name so that the configuration snippets to be included aren't unique to each jail so that you can template them out once and then sim link them into the right subdirectory. Understood. I look forward to your design doc. Uh, thank you, everyone. See you in some of you tomorrow on the BHUB call and in a week for this call. Uh, can I apply for tomorrow's call? Absolutely. Okay. I'll add you to the list. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you, everyone. See you next Talk week. to you soon. Take care. Bye.